Great. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you so much. Great to see you all. Sound great today. I got a question for you to start our time, and it's not from me. This is a question from Jesus. Are you tired? Are you tired? You know, I think, uh, I don't know if it's a post-COVID thing. There was a shift, I think, where we used to be, hey, how you doing? Man, I'm busy. You know, like that was like this high virtuous thing. Um, but now we're a little more honest. How you doing? Man, I'm tired. I'm tired. But then those of us who are really honest, I'm exhausted. Like, how are you doing? I, I can't. I can't. How many of you are there? Like mass confession. Anybody just exhausted today? Like, be honest, right? I'm not forcing you into that. Like, no, I'm pretty good. But a lot of us are. I've talked to our team, our staff team a lot. I've, talked, I've been asking the question a lot of people. People are exhausted nowadays. Um, some of y'all, you may follow, there's a great Mexican restaurant down in Austin known for its, its sign. Does anybody follow El Arroyo? On, so um, this week they put, put this out. Um, what do you call a can opener? It doesn't work, right? A can't opener. Um, and some of y'all are just there like, I can't anymore. I can't do this. Um, and some of you, let's be honest, this, it was challenging for you to get here this morning. I mean, some of us, we wrestle with um, maybe social anxiety. Just and, and sometimes Sunday morning can be one of the most challenging times of the week for you. Um, some of us are dealing with apathy and indifference. We ought to address that probably soon. Oh, next week we're going to talk about that. Um, because we're walking through all of these things that we all wrestle with. Uh, last week we started this series that Brandon noted that we call Real Life. Um, and last week we talked about mental health and um, anxiety and depression, even suicide ideation and a lot that's going on. Um, it resulted, I, I met with our mayor of University Park a few months ago and to talk about, he came to my office, we want to talk about the issues that we're facing. We're seeing our congregation and particularly among our, our young people. And uh, then we gathered all the faith leaders together. And last week, we all together in our community said, let's talk about, let's normalize conversations around mental health and wellness. Because this is the issue that rose to the top. And so throughout this series, we're just talking about real stuff, real life. And um, today, we're going to uh, receive the invitation from Jesus himself. Here's how he finishes this. This is out of Matthew 11. This is from the message the translation. Look at this. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And then I love this. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And that's so good. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Anybody need that? Anybody want that today? This, co this comes as a promise, by the way. From the one who comes through on his promises. Always has, always will. Okay? So today, um, we're going to continue, as we said, this series. Now, one of the things that I want to say again, last week, we had these, um, these magnets that we made available to everybody, if you weren't here. Six Habits of a Healthy Family. This is for everybody here. You can be single, have roommates. Uh, this, is, this is for everybody. Six habits you can practice that will help you with holistic health and, and, and mental wellness. These are things that help us combat uh, depression and anxiety, among other things. And uh, we have these available if they're not all gone. They were gone, hundreds of them gone. But we're getting more printed, but they'll be outside after. Make a note. If you'd like to grab one, put it in a central place in your family or in your house, your apartment, and then follow along. Okay, it helps you to practice things that will keep you healthy as as uh, as an individual and as a family. So turn to Psalm 37. That's where we are today. Psalm 37. You read it yesterday in your dwell reading plan, um, and so you're ahead of me here. We're not going to go. It's a long psalm. We're not going to do the whole psalm. Um, we're going to just look at verses one through eleven. But uh, this psalm is really interesting. Um, it's going to help us. Uh, figure out, first of all, you know, why we're so exhausted. We're going to talk about um, what we can do to replenish our strength and then how to use the strength that we have. Okay. So um, someone, someone uh, I was talking to earlier said, you know, Jeff, I'm not, an, I'm not like an early bird. And so I was like, okay, so like you're a night owl then, right? Or, or and, no, I'm not a night owl either. Um, I guess I'm just an exhausted pigeon is what I am. 
some of you feel like an exhausted pigeon, right? The, the next thing, the next thing, and all the things, and you come here exhausted today, and you're, maybe you're in a season of exhaustion, and if you're not, we've all been there before. We're talking about next level tired. We're not just talking about tired. Some of you are tired because you're not getting enough sleep, frankly. Like this morning, you're like, yeah, I'm tired. Wow, tell me about that. Well, you didn't tell me. You're up till one in the morning, okay? You know when you're tired, right? Like there's practices we talked about. We're holistic people. Some of you are tired because you're not eating properly. You're not resting properly. Um, so that, so there's, there's a lot around this, but I'm talking about, yes, it can be a whole holistic thing. I'm talking about next level tired uh, because here's the thing. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna just heap a bunch of shame on any of us, but the truth is a lot of us are exhausted um, because watch this, a busy life is not always the sign of a meaningful, purposeful life. It can be. But an exhausted life, that's a sign of a distracted life. And today we're going to really focus in on how we can just overcome times of, of exhaustion. Okay, so this is going to be encouraging for you today. This is a chiastic acrostic, this psalm. All right, now you can press your friends, write that down this month. I mean, th- this week sometime, like at lunch. You know, Psalm 37 is chiastic acrostic. And what that means is, across it, you know what that is, often um, psalms are, and, ver- and places in scripture are actually like a Hebrew letter, like the whole alphabet here, so that they can memorize the entire psalm and large portions, in fact, the Torah, like lots of scripture. Um, a chiasm is where there's a statement or phrase that's made, and then on the backside of it, it answers that or explains it. We use chiasm without knowing it. When we say, um, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's chiasm. Um, That's a chiastic kind of literary tool that um, writers use, and we see it in Hebrew a lot. Um, But here, the whole psalm is a chiasm, which is really interesting. It runs um, all the way to patterns and comes back to where they started. But in the middle of the pattern... Is this, is this phrase we're going to see today. This is one we don't use a whole lot, but it says, it says those who are, are righteous in following the Lord, they inherit the land, and then those who are evil are cut off from the land. We're like, okay, what's that mean in North Texas today? To be cut off from the land was to be cut off from the promises of God, is what that's about. And we'll see how this plays out a little bit and how we get there and get back to it, Okay. Uh, but that's really what this psalm is about. The principle, overall principle here is those who do evil and fail to acknowledge God are going to be cut off from his promises, all right? And so how does this apply to North Dallas, North Texas? Um, and the writer of Hebrews will help us here. Because what we need, these, the opposite of exhaustion is not rest. It is that, but it's deeper than that. Because the problem the, the problem why we're exhausted is deeper than most of us know, and we're going to get underneath it. We don't think deeply about this enough. And so the solution is deeper than we know. And the rest that will come, the writer of Hebrews tells us, is this. We come into the land, yes, into the presence of God, and we experience soulful gospel peace rest. That's what we need, isn't it? So let's dive in. Let's ask the first question. Uh, we got three hows of exhaustion. The first one is, how did I get so exhausted? Again, this is beyond just being tired, and all of us can be exhausted. Our young people can be exhausted. Teenagers are exhausted. Senior adults are exhausted. We're, we're, we can all be exhausted. How do we get there? Look at verse one. Here we go. All right, fret not yourself, this is the ESV, because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Now, this may surprise you. Watch this. This is why we're exhausted. You catch it? Look at it. Fret and envy. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight a couple of Hebrew words here. We don't always, well, we do it sometimes because it helps to know the original language. Before we apply scripture, you have to know what is it saying. But here's, there's a question before that. What did it say? What did it say to the original hearers? Because if we jump to application, we make up all kinds of stuff. Um, instead of really knowing what did it really say and what is it then, if we know what it did say, how does that apply to us today? How do we, what is it saying to us today? And that's what we're going to look at today. This word fret, we don't use that word a lot. I doubt you've said fret uh, this week. I'm, I'm just kind of doubt, doubtful. Um, but hispael in the, in the Hebrew is the word fret and it's really hard to translate. In fact, most translations have it as fret. When you think of fret, what do you think of? You think of worry, right? Or you think of fear, but it's a certain kind of fear. 
that's driven by something in the definition of the word. The word fret literally means to heat oneself up with vexation. We don't use that word a lot either. It means to be really annoyed, like working yourself to, up to anger because of, yes, things that are happening around you, but you're working yourself up with frustration and anger that can lead to exhaustion. So this word, this is what's helpful. When you don't really know what a word, you know, how you translate it, or it shows up just a few times in scripture, you look at other places, right? In scripture. So in Jeremiah twenty-two fifteen, it says this, do you think you're a king because you can compete with cedar or compete in cedar, meaning you get more and more cedar. It's like saying in our day, so you're, you're, you run your own business. You think you could run the nation? Really? You know, it's like somebody coming to me with a cowboy shirt on. Hey, what do you, what do you think they're going to do with that? You know, what's, what's Zeke going to do this year? Is he going to leave us? And I'm like, you know, there's people higher up in the organization, you know, making those kinds of decisions than me. I just have the t-shirt, right? But, it, but what it's saying, here's the thing. The, the, what this word is, you think you can compete and, and you're not even, you think you're a king? That, that's the word fret. And then another verse you might know is Jeremiah 12, 5 that says, hey, so you can run with men on foot, but they outrun you. You can't keep up with them. What makes you think you can contend with horses? Contend is the word fret. Compete, fret. That's all the same word. What is the connection here? You and I are exhausted because we are competing and we're comparing ourselves to others, which both can only do be done by comparison. When you think of fret, you're worried, you're competing, which is only understandable or because of comparison, right? And you're exhausted because you're comparing yourself to others. That's the, so why are, we, why are we exhausted? Why do we compete? Why are we comparing ourselves? The Hebrew parallelism shows us here. Why? Envy. That's why. Because you're jealous, you're envious. All right, so we're competing and comparing because we are envious of others. That's what David is telling us here. And we said this, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And it's why so many of us are exhausted and we're not experiencing the joy of the Lord that gives us strength. So at the heart of it, if you go deeper and deeper into all of your craziness and your exhaustion, you're worn out mentally, you're worn out physically, you're worn out emotionally, it's because in large part you're comparing yourself, competing, and, you're, and look at what he says here. He's, notice it says evildoers, wrongdoers. To, to, so two things here. Why in the world as believers, if, big if, you're a Christian, why are we running after evil doers, the things of this world, those who are far from God. And we all do this. We fall, fall into the temptation of being like everybody else comparison here in North Dallas. Like I got to have that, got to have that thing and that thing. And he's saying, why would we chase after those who are evil doers, wrongdoers, and not, not pursue the things of righteousness? He's saying, cause we're no longer, here's the thing as, as Christians. Now we have a different King, right? Like I was talking to Everett earlier before baptism, and he's, he's saying, Jesus is Lord of my life. I said, yes, Lord means king. It means ruler. You have a new master. Why is it that we would be now under a new king, living in a new kingdom, and yet chasing after the stuff of this world? When we do, we're going against now who we are. You're now a fish out of water, and a fish out of water cannot breathe, exhausted, because we're chasing after the things of the, the evil things of this world. And you say, see, it's not that evil. I mean, really? Yes. No, really. There's righteousness and there's evil. But the other side of this is sin is exhausting, isn't it? I mean, not just personally, but living in a fallen world is exhausting. I had a moment this week. I was just working myself up to frustration with all that's going on in the world. I, I was, are, are, are we serious about this? I mean, we got, we got children being killed in schools. We got transgender men that are seeking to be dressing up like women and competing in sports against women. I mean, I was, so I was taking, I was all into this and reading all about it. And I'm, I was, and I'm, I'm, I'm studying for this passage. I mean, this message, I'm going, I'm working myself up with vexation and frustration. <laughs> and you say, well, Jeff, isn't it true? I mean, like we, we're not to live. I mean, shouldn't we? combat, come after the world and, and like cancel people and, and, out, and be outraged by all that's happening. Shouldn't we hang on because the text tells us otherwise. And surely Jesus showed us another way. 
which again is surprising. But some of you, you are fearful, you're envious. It's led you to frustration and exhaustion because you are allowing way too much, like me, even at a point this week, to get into your mind. Now, this is partly a generational thing, but some, some of us are constantly letting the news and news channels, our news feeds, our favorite commentary, whatever, commentators, tell us, watch this, not only what's happening, but how we ought to feel about what's happening and how we should fret and how we should envy. Be fearful of these people and be envious uh, because they're getting what you ought to be getting. And we work ourselves up and we're crazy. And, we, and, and look, we lose our Christian witness as a result. There's a better way. There is a better way because here's why envy is so evil. Envy says, and yes, evil, because envy says you have what I want and I should be getting what you're getting. I don't like you because you're getting what, I'm, what I should be getting. That's where it goes. And that, gang, leads to all kinds of trouble. So how do we live in all of this? See, David is telling us there's two things here, fear that paralyzes and envy that will rot the soul. And David tells us here why we shouldn't envy the wicked, okay, the sinful, the evil stuff of this world. Look at verse 2. For they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Why? It's temporary. That's why. It's like Jesus. Don't store up things on earth. He doesn't say don't store up things. He says store up treasures in heaven. And then Jesus explained, why do we not store up things on earth? Because it's stupid. Sorry if you don't use that word in your house. That's what, that's what Jesus says. It's foolish. That's why. Why? It doesn't last. That's what David is saying. Don't run after all this stuff. You're making yourself crazy. You're exhausted running after things of this world. And you're, and you're allowing other things to make you crazy. Don't do it. Why not? Because it's temporary. And, and this, this verse right here reminds us. Uh, it's really the opposite of um, Isaiah 40, verse 8, that says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever, right? Brandon was noted, I mean, I love this time of the year where everything's turning green and then we go back to winter for a day or so. But um, every, all, everything's blooming, right? And I love springtime in Dallas. This is my favorite time of the year. Everything's coming back to life. But um, yeah, until about July, August, and you're like, can we go to Colorado now? I mean, can we live somewhere else? Um, because everything's brown, right? Everything starts to die if you don't water it. And, and that, because it's temporary, same kind of thing. This is what he's saying to us. So what, what would this look like? How would you know? How would you know if you're, being, you're exhausted because comparison, competition, all the things, or working yourself up over the evil world that we live in? How would you know? What would it look like? Well, it looked like it looked like worry. It would look like hurry. It would look like um, you don't have time to slow down. It would look like you don't experience Sabbath in your life. It would look like you don't rest. It would look like you have a, ro- a low grade frustration much of the time. It would it would look like you have an inability to sleep. Um, you're struggling. You can't say no. It would look a lot like that. But here's the challenge. How about this? Can I go further? It looked like you don't pray much. It looked like you're not in the Word because you're too busy. You got other things that you're doing. You you can't even spend five ten minutes say in in the dwell reading in the Psalms. What's up with that, right? It would look like you're focused on all kinds of other, you're distracted and you're exhausted. Can I challenge you to come to Jesus today? Because it's, that's where we find rest. That's where all of this is going, you might have guessed. But the challenge here is that in our culture, uh, this kind of stuff is applauded. Like, and I've fallen into this. You can imagine as your pastor, frankly, like our pastor's about to kill himself serving Jesus. We love him so much. Go pastor. We're praying for you. You know, but go like you're killing you the way to go. And I've slipped into that, but we're to live countercultural lives. Aren't we? We're to be dissident, subversive disciples living in the kingdom with a king. And so our lives look different. 
Not lazy, not slothful, but instead we live out of rest. I've said it this way. You know, Jesus was often busy, but he was never in a hurry because he knew exactly who he was and he followed the Lord and he, he was confident in his love with the Father. And that's the way that we can live as well. So how is your pace? How are you doing? Would you describe your life as, yes, experiencing a lot of unrest, dis-ease in your spirit? See, th- this, is, this is what is so challenging uh, with this message. We, we look at the evildoers out there. But maybe the reason we can't slow down is because we have dreams that we have established for ourselves that may or not be according to God's plan. Maybe the evil's in us. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not everybody else's fault. Maybe it's us and we need to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I have a distracted life. I'm not living with purpose and with significance and meaning. So let's get to this next question. We know now why we are so tired, but how do I recover my strength? Now that I've identified where it comes from, and that needs to be talked about a bit more. But look at verse three. Here we go. This is where it gets real practical, this middle portion. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land to befriend faithfulness. Okay, so how do we, how do we come against culture? You know, how do we make a difference? How do we combat? How do I cancel everybody out there? How do I rage against everybody, all the sinners who are out there? Trust the Lord and do good. That's how we combat it. No, but like, couldn't I just like tell everybody how I feel and just drop something out there on social media, rage against the, you know, the Republicans or the Democrats. Can I do that? Trust the Lord and do good. That's it. And that's still it in our day today. So this word trust, here's another word, bata. In the Hebrew, it means to find safety and security in something or someone. It's to find confidence, not in comparison or competition, but in the Lord. To trust in him is to find your confidence in him. That's where I will go. You combat all of this stuff that's coming at you by trusting in the Lord and doing good. I love that. And notice that it says you don't run scared We're not fearful. You don't escape from the world. Did you catch this? It says, dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. That is beautiful. And that is how we change the world. How do we recover our strength? You do good. You embrace a daily faithful presence right where God has placed you. That's what you do. So look at verse four. This is a a well-known verse. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now this verse is so important to understand. It's not a prominent uh, kind of theology, a popular theology. If I delight in the Lord, then he gives me whatever I desire. This is a prosperity gospel of sorts. That's not what this is saying. Perhaps you know that. I hope you know that. This is not what that's saying. Some of us have a transactional uh, relationship with God, a lot more than we know. If I do this, so I go to church, he's going to bless me. If my kids grow up in church, then they're going to be just solid citizens and we're not going to have any problems. If I just follow Jesus, I'm not going to deal with anxiety. If I just really pray a lot, I'm not going to wrestle with depression. See, we said it last week. Coming to Jesus does not mean that your life will always go well with you. Coming to Jesus means that whatever you face in life, you have him and now you can walk and he will walk with you through whatever life brings your way. And he's more than enough for you. And so here... Instead of being transactional, it's saying if you, and and again, this is why we need to understand the key word, delight. What does this mean? What does it mean to delight in the Lord? This is a word, aneg, in in the Hebrew. And I found this fascinating. Hard word to translate. Um, And the word literally means, yes, to take pleasure in, to delight in. But the the root of the word means delicate or tender. This is is a romantic word. This is finding real... um, intimacy with another person where, where you feel really safe. I love being with you. It's like, it's like frankly, it's like me and, and being with my wife, Stacy, delighting in her, her delighting in me means that I want my desires to be her desires. No, I want her desires to become my desires. So when we delight in the Lord, he gives us his desires our lives start to align up with him. When Stacy and I were dating, in fact, 
this became our verse. This is our verse. Uh, Cause we were like this, this we, we dated other people and such, but we started dating and really getting to know each other. And I was like, uh Oh, this is different. This is like, this is real. This is getting serious. I don't know if it's the thing, but this is different. So we both started to talk about that. And we both began to pray this prayer. Lord, we're going to delight in you as best we can. We're going to trust in you. And Lord, you give us desires. If it's for us to be together, increase our desires. If not, take our desires away. And I think we were as honest as we could. We don't want to get married. Like if, you, if, this isn't, if we're not to get married. So we're going to delight in you. Give us your desire. It's aligning your life up with God. I could argue this is what prayer is about. Prayer's not, Lord, give me, give me this and give me this and give me this and give me, I'm back again. Give me this and give me this. Oh, I'm delighting in you now. Give me this and give me this and give me this. That's not prayer. Prayer is instead the prayer of Jesus in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. So when you align your life up with the purposes of God, how do you know the purposes of God? His word. Are you in his word? His spirit speaks to us. Let me pray scripture back to the Lord. Lord, I'm going to pray according to your will. Watch this. You pray according to his will. He will answer your prayer 100% of the time. Every time. Maybe prayer is more about aligning our will with God than it is asking him for things. Somebody said amen. All right, let's practice that, gang, this week, all right? But I love this. This is such a great thing. And, and so when we delight in him, he gives us his desires, and they are what we desire, you see, as we grow in him. Some have called this, the twist on this, they've called it um, Christian hedonism. Augustine had this kind of idea that love God and do as you please. But a lot of people don't finish his, 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 his idea there, which is because, he says, because the soul trained to love God or love the beloved, he said, uh, will never do anything to offend the beloved. You see? To delight in him means you're going to obey him or you're not delighting in him. You, your will is aligned up with him and now you're following him, all right? So trust, do good, delight in him. Look at verse five. Verse five says, commit your way to him, trust in him. There's the word again, and he will act. That's trust, isn't it? Let him act. Like let him bring justice. If the way of your life, the direction of your life, the tra trajectory of your life is to follow him, he will act for you, okay? He will act. So look at verse six. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. David reminds us, God is the one who brings justice. Yeah, but I got to fix it though. No, God, God will bring justice. Yeah, but aren't we supposed to speak into it? Yes, we are, but we're to do it as we trust in him. So this is where the rest is found. God is in control, okay? So see, Bob Marley was on to something. Every little thing is gonna be all right. Okay, um, but not because we're escaping from the world or smoking weed or something, but we're actually embracing all that's coming at us, trusting in the Lord. And, and sorry, kids, if that reference made no sense to you, talk to your parents about that um, or talk to your grandparents. Like they're all in. They, like, they know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so... Um, in, in, sorry, I, I got off track so we can rest. We can rest in him. Let's get back to verse seven. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. How many, that's so hard to do, isn't it? Be still and wait on him. Trust in the Lord. He'll bring justice. He's going to bring light to the situation. We got to trust in him. Be wait patiently. Here's that word again. Fret. Don't compete. Don't don't be in competition and comparison, not yourself. See, don't fret yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Again, stop comparing. Be patient. Practice restraint. This is trust, isn't it? Trusting in the Lord. This sounds a lot like um, Psalm 46, verse 10. Some of you know. Be still and what? Know that I am God. And that's another great Hebrew word. Be still. Let your hands hang down and know that I'm God. Stop. Stop. Rest in him. No wonder we're so exhausted. We don't trust the Lord as we should. We don't delight in him as we should. Okay, so how did I get so exhausted? Comparison and competition. What can I do to recover my strength? We abide. We delight. We, we wait on him. We trust in him. But isn't there a redeemed ambition? Like, did, like just go home and take a nap? Listen, the most holy thing some of you can do today is go home and take a nap. 
Like the most obedient thing you can do. But it doesn't mean that tomorrow you're like, ah, I'm going to blow off this. I know I'm supposed to be doing this. That's, that's slothfulness. Isn't there work to be done? So how can I use my strength that I've been given? How do we use the strength we've been given? Now, if you're here today and you're just exhausted, I got a word for you. And I want to encourage you today. Sometimes we're just so exhausted we can hardly take a step forward. And some of us who really wrestle with depression, anxiety, know what I'm talking about. Alan Noble has written a, a new book um, that's called On Getting Out of Bed. He's a professor theologian. The subtitle of the book is, um, is The Gift and Burden of Living. And he, he wrestles, he's really honest um, about well, how do you deal with depression and anxiety. And he says, what he's saying is sometimes it's just doing the next thing. And not, not just trudging through. Yes, it feels like you're trudging through. But listen, that's glorifying to God. You're honoring God. Like, I don't have much strength to bring to that. I'm not bringing a lot of strength these days. No, but do the next thing. That is enough. That is glorifying God. Like sometimes it's just getting out of bed. And then after that, it's like, you know, I'm going to eat breakfast next. And I'm going to, I'm going to, Go to work next. I'm going to do the next thing. Sometimes life is that way. And a lot of you here today, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, that's the way it goes. But I want to encourage you that doing the next thing is, is bringing glory to God. And you're just honoring him in every, every way. Look at verse 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. This is now he's saying, when you start to fret and you begin to just live this out, come after evil against evil, you, now you're doing evil. And that's what we're seeing in our culture today, right? Look at verse 9. For the evildoers shall be cut off. And though, there it is. Here's the pinnacle of it all. And those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. This is the crux of the psalm. See, inheriting the land means that you've come home, all right? You've come to rest, the place where you belong. That's, that's the whole analogy here. But it seems like the wicked are prospering for so long. They seem to be winning. Look at verse 10. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. I go to his house and he's gone. In no time, listen, if we live in light of eternity, if we live in a different kingdom with a different king, this frees us up, gang, to understand that life is temporary. We don't have to wrestle or worry about the stuff of this world. And then he says, here it is, verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant. Everybody say it together. What's that last word? Peace. That's where we're heading. That's what we desire. Check it out. Abundant peace. The meek shall inherit the land. What does this sound like? Anybody? Sound like the attitudes, doesn't it? So like Jesus, Jesus references this in the Beatitudes in, in, in Matthew 4. He's saying this, those who have received gospel rest and peace, those who've ceased to try to justify themselves through their work and all that they're doing, the approval of others and all of our performance, those who are trying to validate themselves, but instead have found rest in me because Jesus went to the cross for us. He died on the cross for us. You see, we find rest in him. This is gospel rest and peace. Friends, this is what you're looking for. Abundant peace. This is what we all need. But think about David. I'll land it this way. David the king is writing to us. He's a man after God's own heart. That's how we know him. David's now an older man. David committed adultery. David had a man murdered. He leveraged his power to abuse a woman and then kill a man. David has blood on his hands. David's family was all kinds of jacked up. David had multiple lives, I mean wives. He, 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 he was not always meek. He did not always delight in the Lord. David couldn't do it. David is pointing us to another king. David is pointing us He's only an ancestor of an offspring to come that will be the perfect king. Because Jesus came, 
He lives it out perfectly for us because we couldn't. He did trust the Father. He did delight in him. He did take on justice himself, injustice of the world. He took on the evil of the world himself to set us free. His death and resurrection means now I can trust in him because my righteousness is not found in my work, my competition, my comparison and competing. I don't have to envy everybody else because all that I have, I have found in Jesus. Amen? We can live this way, friends. I'm trying to speak courage into your life, encouragement into your life, but you must come to Jesus. It's why in Hebrews 4, the writer of Hebrews says, there was a hope of God's people to come into the promised land, the inherited land. And some of them didn't. They were disobedient. Don't be like them. But others came in and they didn't find ultimate, pre- ultimate peace. As, as Joshua it was another, talking about another peace to come. David then talks about another peace to come and he has come. Peace is found in him. The one who the writer of Hebrews says in chapter four, he is our high priest who has come and he's, 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 he's gone through the heavens, meaning he's done it all. He's come to us. He's died on the cross. He's gone back again. And he is one who sympathizes with us in our weakness. He's the advocate that we need. He is the high priest who now stands before God and bridges the gap between sinful people like us who can come into the land and find home, find peace, And what I want to do now is to challenge you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to close with a song. And we're going to close today. I want everybody to just bow your head before the Lord. Are you exhausted? Are you tired? And here's what I want to do, friends. We're going to have a time of response. Because sometimes we don't need to just rush out to the next thing. We have time. And if you're exhausted today, maybe you need to respond. To literally uh, come. Come to him today, come to the altar to move. As many have done this morning, maybe you just want prayer over you or you just want to come and pray and mark today as a day where you start to leverage the strength you do have for him and to trust him. Are you tired today? Hear the words of Jesus again. This this is an invitation from our Savior. Are you tired, worn out, Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, he says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and and work with me. I'll show you how to take a real rest here. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy on you or ill-fitting. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So friends, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, an attitude of prayer. Are you exhausted today? What are you going to do? And maybe the first step is simply to come and pray. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My life has been driven by competition and comparison. And I'm sorry. I've not been delighting in you. And I want to just mark this day, this moment, as a time where I come to you. 